Hello, it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Klaus Bode, founding director and head of environmental design at Urban Systems Design, an innovative environmental design and building system consultant company based in London. With over 30 years of professional experience, Klaus's work has been focused on environmental design strategies and low energy engineering and innovative solutions at both building and master plan scales. Klaus has also a 20 year involvement with academia, collaborating with universities in the UK, the rest of Europe and South America. He has collaborated with a wide range of internationally acclaimed architects on unique building and master plan projects across Europe, the Americas, Africa, the Middle East and the Far East. In the last decade, some of the key projects that Klaus has led environmental design approach include the Sohar, Sohar International Bank headquarters in Oman, the Korea University campus in India, the Dubai Creek Tower in Dubai, the Emirates Pavilion at Dubai World Expo 2020, the Battersea Power Station Phase 2, the Olympic Velodrome in London, and the One Monte Carlo Hotel in Monaco, among many others. Let me finally mention that I was very lucky to have Klaus as my tutor and supervisor when studying at the EA SED program some 13 years ago. So it's particularly special for me to introduce him as a keynote speaker in PLIA 2020. In his talk, Klaus will address some of the most important topics of the conference, including the role of technology and design in planning future cities in a post-carbon scenario. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Klaus Bode. Uh, I'm a director of Urban System Design. We are a practice of environmental consultants and MEP engineering consultants. And um, I have been invited by Jorge to share with you some of our experiences in, as practitioners and um, environmental and engineering design since I've been practicing since uh, 1987. So I've been going for quite a while. And uh, I had the pleasure of first time encountering Jorge at the Architectural Association in the SED course, Sustainable Environmental Design, about 13 years ago. And uh, we've stayed together since because we often meet at the AA, I a little bit less these days, but uh, it's a bit of a fan club for those who are in love with environmental design and PLEA is a big conference that many AA or XA's students and colleagues attend. Um, why urban system design? Just briefly, um, I was a partner in a practice called BDSP Partnership and one or two little examples of projects you'll see today come from that time. And then in 2012, I joined the board of directors of Chapman BDSB. And in 2018, I set up Urban System Design with two of my partners, John Perry and Pankaj Dave. We call ourselves Urban System Design primarily because we look at both micro building design to macro scale urban master planning design. And uh, understanding the symbiotic relationship really between building design and larger scale neighborhood or even cities. Uh, over my years in practice, I've started to understand more and more that uh, we need to emphasize a lot more on urban and city scale than just building scale. And hopefully through my uh, presentation this afternoon, um, you will see that coming through. And I think the subject that the conference is about, which starts talking also about blending technology, research and design is an essential component to achieving the post-carbon city objective. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about timescales because really everybody talks about 2050 where we should achieve a zero carbon development, zero carbon cities. And we already are at 2020, only 30 years away from that target. 
some research and scientists say we need to achieve those targets even before 2050. And it is quite a tough challenge to achieve that. And uh, you'll see some in the time scales, some little names sitting of projects, which I will touch on in my presentation. And as you can imagine, the last three, CREA, Trenetia Master Plan, X, I'll talk about that too, have longer time frames because obviously they go over a series of years because it's a very large scale development. And uh, whilst on one level, 2050 may seem still a long distance away, I took the pleasure of uh, aging myself, what I might look like by 2050, and what I looked like when I was 27 in 1990. So what you see is what I am in the middle. And uh, don't be too shocked. This is where I will be in 2050. Um, the purpose of this sort of little bit of humor is to say we will witness the entire development over these 60 years. Hopefully I will. And it is both a daunting but also an enlightening experience because there is a sense of urgency in all of us to deliver change. Understanding these objectives in design, we tend to design in the present but maybe not focus enough on the future. And this little diagram here tends to show you the sort of conflicts of today, tomorrow. The size of the, the, the circles define the scale of the problem, the color, whether it's extremely a relevant issue. And uh, so the combination of the two will kind of guide you or as a designer where the priorities should be. You can't prioritize everything. You must consider everything, multiple facets, but there need to be certain priority when it comes to whether it's investment or design. And the, this example here, will change from country to country and also over time. So uh, whilst issues like water and energy, this is based in London, may not be the biggest issue or in some urbanized other cities, but pollution and transport is a major, major issue. I personally believe through the decades to come through electrification, transport will become less critical, air quality will get better, water and energy will escalate in terms of need and urgency. But two areas I would like to particularly draw attention to, which at this day and age in urban planning does not get enough attention to, is the outdoor amenity space, the spaces between buildings and biodiversity. And this is something we need to pay attention to. In that context, uh, I've always been fascinated uh, with buildings, the micro scale in my earlier years, but started to understand through my working life that buildings per se, focusing on them is really insufficient. You could argue it's also the wrong way of looking at things. In other words, there is a very close interrelationship between buildings and their neighborhoods or parts of cities. And the two, the city or the neighborhood and the building communicate with each other. They respond to each other. And the dilemma we face in probably most parts of the world is that when we go for planning, when we apply to get planning permission to develop, it is normally done on a building by building case. And the environmental parameters or planning requirements that are imposed on the design of a particular building, these obviously vary from country to country and cities to cities even. But these planning requirements basically make a designer achieve certain target objectives, whether they're energy efficiency, carbon emission, water consumption, biodiversity, whatever the parameter may be, at micro scale, at building scale. And a lot of these are not that cost effective. 
and there is a potential conflict between investment and achieving environmental objectives at that scale. Instead, if one could introduce a, what I call, negotiate a trade-off between investment that a developer does in a building into a neighborhood scheme, then, and planning can be granted on those bases, I certainly believe we will achieve far more in reducing carbon emissions in cities in a far more cost-effective manner. So it does require changes in planning, laws and regulations, which is obviously quite difficult. In the end, the problem we face is not of building scale, it's about macro or city scale or global scale in the end of the day. And uh, as we all know, with increasing migration and urbanization, this problem will just escalate. So we absolutely must understand urban infrastructure and the interrelationship between city and building or neighborhood and building. A little <clears throat> guidance we use to help us develop this is to look at what we call the environmental design approach. It is a simplified methodology represented diagrammatically here, by which we need to first step is look at minimizing demand. Whatever demand is, water, energy, minimize waste generation. And when we look at all of that, we need to start understanding the site first, the climate. I sometimes use the word, the three C's, climate, culture, context, and then start looking at building form, manipulating building form, looking at building orientation, then move on to facade design. And all of these elements is about architecture, maximizing passive design, whether you call it biclimatic architecture, passive design, green design, whatever you may want to call it, but really looking at how to reduce the demand for consumables without even considering technology at this stage. And therefore, you will very quickly understand how placing buildings in an urban context are influenced and vice versa. Then look at technical systems, look at what technology offers, and lastly, controls. There is a lot of talk about smart buildings, smart cities, which may well be true, but if that is dealt with on the control level, I am concerned if you do not pay equal or more attention to the actual design of the building itself. It's like in a car, you can have a very sophisticated engine, very energy efficient, but if the car is not aerodynamic, you will still consume more energy. So the focus should really be on passive design. And we all know about vernacular architecture. They didn't have technology and they were masters at developing passive design. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about how can research, technology, and design come together to hopefully achieve the target of the post-carbon city. So what are our challenges and opportunities? I've got uh, quite interested in this picture. This picture is Death Valley in America. It is the driest spot, um, highest temperatures. You heard in the news recently, they had record temperatures in America here. And yet, funnily enough, every so often, nature shows itself when they have the large rainfalls and all the seeds below the ground emerge and you have these amazing blooming fields. So, this is meant to be, for me, a kind of inspiration. Um, we can either take a doomsday scenario or say, look what nature has, look what we could do, even in Death Valley, look what can happen. So let's pull our finger out and do something about it. There's an interesting book. I'm not here to uh, sell books, but there is a very interesting book around. I recommend that you read by Hans Rosling, unfortunately he's passed away, Swedish author. And 
the book Factfulness I found inspiring because what he has done over many years, collected a lot of data and basically demystified ideas that people have across a number of things, whether it's poverty, wealth, environmental damage. And what he's saying in simple terms is that when you actually start tracking where we are today over time, we are developing positively, which is a positive message. But of course, through this development, we are also creating damage. But we need to understand what the damage is, but we also need to understand how things are evolving through facts rather than interpretation or as we all hear nowadays, fake news is almost real news. Unfortunately, it's a very dangerous line to take, hence the word factfulness. We all know about population growth. <clears throat> I'm mentioning a few contextual statistical elements here because let's face it, it's a global issue and if we want to achieve the post-carbon city, we need to take a bigger picture view. What this is abstracted from Hans Rosling's book, what this is showing is, you know, we are somewhere around the 7 million, 6 to 7 mil billion, I beg your pardon, world population. And some forecasts say population keeps on growing. Hans Rosling says, no, it doesn't we will be flattening out. It could be between 10 to 12 billion people, still huge number of people. But the reason for flattening out is because of increased wealth, therefore better health, longer life, and smaller families. This is classically the model that you see and has been seen over many decades in the transformation or in Europe and in America, and signs of it are happening in other parts of the world as well. But the challenges are enormous. With so many people seeking better lives in cities and urbanization, the informality in cities increasing, especially in the developing world, and climate change. We all know this is real, the signs are there for us people are not even talking about will it happen the subject and discussion is how bad will it be now and thirdly comes the subject of technology is technology an enabler or is te technology a disabler of human resource you can look at it both ways at the end of the day the position is one where do you allow technology to enter into the realm of design, being positive, as opposed to taking over the role of the designer, which would be, in my view, a challenge, a negative. And AI, artificial intelligence, is also becoming ever more increasingly evident in the design of smart buildings, therefore smart cities, technologies. AI is another an element that has both positive and negative connotations. If it's there to supervise what you do, who will use my data, what happens in the wrong hands, negative. However, if we don't learn from behavioral modeling and analysis through data gathering, how will we know how we actually behave? Because ultimately, However we design buildings or cities, what drives consumer, consumerism, whether it's energy, materials, transportation, is us humans, understanding our behavior. And I'm particularly fascinated with human behavioral analysis and the feedback of that in the design of buildings, which I don't see much of, to be honest. Coming back, to the subject of wealth. Hans Rosling, this is an abstract uh, from his book, talks about not the rich and the poor, the developed and the developing. He doesn't differentiate in these continental ways. He differentiates 
uh, the well-being or the life of mankind into four groups, which she calls levels one to levels four, and classifies them and considers them through five particular categories, how we sleep, how we eat, how we cook, how we go to work, wherever we go, and water, the most important element in life, how do we have access to water? I think the images are self-explanatory. And the little men, the yellow men on the right, they give you an idea if you divide it up basically uh, six to seven billion, each little man is about a billion people in which category they sit. So you will see the majority still sit in level two, get less in level three, but a minority in level one and level four. But there's change coming. And the change in wealth growth is interesting in the sense that about three years ago, the bulk of the people sit in level two and three, but this is shifting. So in parallel with us trying to achieve the zero carbon targets in 2050, already by 2040, the majority of the population has moved out of level two into a level three. Level three, coupled with a shift change where wealth grows. It will grow in what we call emerging countries and some developing world and the developed or Western world, as it's sometimes called, is getting less in percentage terms. All of this will culminate into a particular point which I'll lead to. So now what we have, we have a transitioning out of more and more out of poverty towards wealth, coupled with an increased population, and equally, an a and the aging population is left in the developed world, and the youthful population, younger and younger average years, these are the average ages of the populations in the different continents, in the developing world. So what is the net result of all of this? The net result of all of this is that through an increased population, through increased wealth, through younger average years, more people coming and seeking work in cities and urbanization, younger people embracing technology, energy demand, in particular electrical energy, will rise substantially. However, um, I am a firm believer that the younger people have something extra to give. So the first thing we're starting to see in many parts of the world is where you can, is a switch to an electrification. The decarbonization of electrical grids in Europe and parts of America, but still not fast enough. What we have learned so far is that waiting for buildings or neighborhoods, and therefore by consequence cities, to achieve near to zero carbon or emissions or very low energy developments is taking too long we will not get to our target on that basis alone. So the infrastructure networks that services cities or buildings need to go green, the so-called decarbonization race. In some parts of the world, for example, in France, you have nuclear power. It has a different set of problems, but it is a zero carbon energy. You go to Norway with hydropower, or other parts of the world, like in Brazil with hydropower, it's also a zero carbon emission energy source. However, there are big discussions about the environmental impact of those. And those of you who have been following in Africa, they're just about building the biggest dam is almost finished in Africa between Ethiopia and Sudan, creating the, all sorts of different geopolitical problems, Egypt being worried whether the Nile Delta will get enough water. So all these technologies that exist are there zero carbon, but they have also other problems or issues associated with them. 
Nevertheless, we are switching to power. For example, in England, at the moment, in planning, you cannot even get planning permission if you go for what we call gas supplied systems. So alternatives are being sought. sought. The paradox that I believe exists is that in our developed world, we have more money, um, but at the end of the day, and op therefore opportunities to develop more sustainable solutions and greener technologies and um, make it more economic and viable for us to, to adapt, adopt those, sorry. But the problem is the real increase in demand for energy and therefore emissions will shift and is already shifting to countries in the developing world. They may not be the main centers of energy consumption and pollution because they don't have the economic means. But if you remember the little models and diagrams in Hans Rosling's book, and you look at the future, not today, how that shift will happen, there will be a transition that these will be the major centers of um, energy consumption, carbon emissions, water consumption. So they don't have certain means. And those of you who have seen a lot of the informal cities in all sorts of parts of the world, from South America, Africa, Asia, Central America, you have them. And even on a much, much, much smaller scale in some parts of Europe, Eastern Europe. What is interesting here is that the infrastructure network is either non-existent or there is an illegal element of connecting to an infrastructure and there is an increasing demand for it. So the paradox is that why not invest more to give a green infrastructure to these parts of the world or these cities so they switch straight away to a post-carbon network of infrastructure, straight away into a zero carbon economy base, and thereby achieve globally better and quicker the 2050 target than retaining that investment knowledge in whether it's in Europe or the Americas. So my my particular interest here is that in Europe, you are constantly debating with clients about, well, is it it's too expensive to be quasi autonomous from the network, it's cheaper to buy electricity and let's sign up to some kind of green electrical supply. And this kind of optioneering, the net result is we are not really changing our design of our buildings or neighborhoods quick enough to achieve 2050 target. But in the other parts of the world where you don't have options, then I think it is imperative we introduce green networks straight away from the beginning. And these will give far, far better results for us all to achieve our 2050 target. So <clears throat> in summary, the challenges we face our old habits because they often die hard, increased demand of consumables, we're losing biodiversity and waste generation everywhere. We all know about the mess in the seas about plastic, etc. So I won't go there. But it's easy to stay stuck on challenges. I think there's some fabulous opportunities. But the opportunities, I have to say, I do not believe sit anymore with us but they sit with our youth. The younger of you in the audience can make real change, but even much younger ones that are five-year-olds today are children. So education is a vital player in this. Environmental awareness, young people are much more environmentally aware. They are much more technology savvy. They are not afraid of using technology the way maybe some of us older people are and they are very action-orientated. 
we all know about all the movements for climate change and Greta and all of this. So I think our success and hope sits with our youth. We are really the catalyst and we must help them get there. One of the things that I found interesting and fascinating is with this race for technology, we forget the human side of things. And human-centric design is an element that really needs to rear its head much more. We hear a lot about health and well-being in design, really important piece, comes back to human-centric. But if I'm honest, this is not something new. The terminology may be new, um, through maybe even certifications like wellness and this. But in reality, it is about sensible, responsible, environmentally orientated, good design. So the challenge sits here between building automation or human focused design. And by health and well being, uh, I'm not here to give a lecture on health and well-being, that's another subject. But to simplify things a bit, and you will see how this all comes together in terms of a low carbon city economy. It's about well-being, the physical well-being, but it's also about the mental, making life pleasant. What is around us? Is it conducive for us to feel good about our homes, our cities? And if we look at a picture like this, I often use this slide with students about this is what I call health and well-being. It is chaotic, but it is somehow beautiful. It's Pollock's work in art. It moves some people, it doesn't others. But it helps us feel good. So there is this symbiotic relationship between it's not just about the physical, it is about the psychological. And I believe it's becoming more of a psychological. You start becoming more sensitized if as a person, you cannot control your environment or move around or do something. And therefore we need to understand what stimulates us. You know, when people talk about comfort in buildings, it isn't just thermal comfort or visual comfort or oral comfort. It is also your moods your social interaction with the people around you at work, at home, at family, with friends. It is what makes us human. And yet you may wonder what has all this got to do with energy and carbon? I will explain. So our urban environment needs to address all of these needs. Yeah. So if you think about some very modern developments, look at London Canary Wharf, you may or may not like the architecture, but I can tell you it's a dead space on weekends. So is this representative of the future of cities? I don't think so. So we need to address a raft of issues, and I think they will inform the health and well-being, not just the physical, the persona in itself. So this is where I'm coming to in the sense of how we should design such spaces. We should move away from being very restrictive in our design, in our design parameters. We should make them much broader, much looser. We should give people choice, let them move around, whether at work, like in your home, not tied to a desk or a place. And technology today enables us to do so. We should empower people to interact with them and migrate. We should not design buildings that are controlled to a fixed set of parameters. They should change as the seasons change, but give people choice to go into cooler, to warmer spots, more connected to outside where it's drafty or no draft, noisy or less noisy. Give them those varieties. And the interesting fact is when we design in this manner, these buildings consume less energy and therefore gen consume and generate less carbon emissions. So, because we forget that we as humans are the most powerful individuals to move about and adapt and adjust. So, whether I want to sit inside a cafe to work or outside on the lawn, 
both are possible. So ideas about even integrating gardens in buildings and even in skyscrapers, nothing new. But why don't we do more of it? I don't know. We just need to break the status quo. I will just run through a few, three projects. There are only one slide each. And we, we call them, I call them exemplary in environmental performance. These are all buildings that have been built and have been running for quite a number of years that I have been personally involved with. So one of the earliest ones is the Comets Bank headquarters in Frankfurt, an office development with Foster and Partners. And it's a high rise building. It's been in operation, as you can see, 1998 is when the people moved in. So we are talking here about 22 years in operation. For the first 15 years, because that's unfortunately data collection stopped, and that's another problem. But for the first 15 years, this building on average, 81% of the year runs in natural ventilation. No heating, no cooling. And it's a tower and it has opening windows. So anyone who tells you high rise buildings, you cannot naturally ventilate or you can't uh, introduce daylight deep, deep into spaces. Sorry, they're wrong. You can. You just have to change how you design buildings. You can't do it with center core schemes. You've got to start carving cut. Second building is the Welsh Parliament. This is a project. I was involved with, with the architects Roger Sturk Harbin Partners. It's the seat, the Parliament government seat of Wales, and was built and finished in 2006. A building that has a lot of natural ventilation was challenged because we cannot have opening windows serving the spaces below because of the fear of biological warfare. So we're bringing all the air in through labyrinth below the ground and back up into the building. But what is interesting about this building, the client, whilst we advocated you do not need much cooling, the client really requested we introduced cooling as a backup measure to the building, which we did. And 10 years in operation in 2016, I received a letter from Lord Rogers saying that the client had written to them and they were amazed that in the first 10 years, the air conditioning system was never switched on. A testament of what passive design can do. The third project is the velodrome for the London 2012 Olympics, Hopkins Architects. What is particularly interesting here is that the challenge in cycling was to ensure more and more world records were broken. And, uh, through, in, in cycling terms, those who understand the cycling and velodromes, it's to do with increased temperatures and thereby reduced air density. So no cooling was introduced into this building, 100% naturally ventilated. Yes, it has heating in, in, the, in the winter, of course. And lo and behold, this was the greenest building in the Olympic Park. But more importantly than anything, many, many world records were smashed during the Olympics in this building. However, as I mentioned before, these, in my view, exemplary projects in the sense of their environmental performance, not just in design terms. Whilst they are wonderful references, and I'm proud to have been part of them, I can equally say they have virtually no impact to the global problem we face. So how can we make such buildings impactful? We make it impactful by learning from them, by understanding what is happening, by getting the data, like post-occupancy evaluation data analytics. Unfortunately, this data is not easily forthcoming, available, or publicly distributable. So unless we start getting information out and about, in particular shared with 
the younger generation students and practitioners to learn from these both are successes and also are failures. I am very skeptical if such wonderful one-off buildings will actually have a positive impact. They can, but we need to approach them in a different way, and they're one-offs. So, as I mentioned earlier, my particular interest has also been shifting towards more urbanized and large-scale developments. And I'm going to pick three particular master plan developments in totally different environments. And this is new work over the last two years and ongoing. One development is in India, where it's a greenfield site. One development, and therefore you could say, by the way, oh, that's easy. Um, it is easy and it is equally challenging because it has to be autonomous. There's no infrastructure. Second development is in Norway. Uh, unusual scenario in the sense that whilst there is an infrastructure around where we've located the site, there is none. So you could call it a quasi Greenfield South too, but it's actually 1,500 homes sitting on a lake. And the third is actually, I believe, one of the most challenging is a very large development master plan residential in London and stitching in to an urban existing tissue and trying to achieve a zero carbon development, I believe is far harder than in greenfield sites. So I'll quickly go through these. The first scheme is the CREA master plan. It's for CREA University in uh, a place called Stray City or near Stray City because the Greenfield site, which is about 55 kilometers north of Chennai. And it's for about 30,000 students. So it's a large university to be rolled out in four phases. The bulk of the development is student accommodation because it's a Greenfield site. So you've got to provide residential facilities for all the students. Equally, residential facilities for all the faculty and staff. Then you have recreational facilities, which you see in blue, kind of sports. And obviously, you have academic, also particular buildings from libraries to research centers, um, arts, laboratories, and all sorts of other elements and faculties. Um, what is particularly interesting, it's a large development, is um, half a million square meter. Um, and what was important is that the architectural solution and the architects here are PLP architects from London, that they started weaving, learning, and living together. We found this a particular interesting challenge because we thought there is no better place but to engender change than embrace the opportunity of creating a university in a greenfield site, a green, sustainable community, show by example, live by example, and measure live data. So this is kind of quickly the climate just simplified, we have huge rains in the monsoon, sometimes leads to flooding and longer, drier periods in uh, the late winter, January to March. You can see images of the site, it's grazing land. It used to be more uh, woodland, but it's been changed to grazing land. And as part of the vision, covering a facet of different aspects, I've just picked up a few that we introduced in there, which deals with environmental responsibility and clearly collaborative working and sharing and learning. And we established six key principles from carbon neutrality to total renewable energy self-sufficiency, water self-sufficiency, no waste to landfill, re-engaging in biodiversity, and above all, human-centered. 
a quick picture of the site. We have some seasonal water bodies, so they fill up in the monsoon periods and are dry in the dry season. Um, we also have natural forests to the south, a little bit to the north. The rest has been man-made. And one of the key drivers in the scheme was to link up the green axis. But because of the seasonality of the rainfalls, and we are not in control of what happens upstream of the seasonal river, we've introduced flood management through use of agriculture, both around the lake and at the entry point of the flood river. What you see is interesting in the sense that I haven't even started talking about placing buildings. We're talking about manipulating landscape beforehand. And if to pick on the six key criteria on human-centered campus briefly, we didn't just mention, oh, let's design for people or health and well-being, but it's these little green uh, bullet points that you see here, some specifics we picked up. In terms of we want to share knowledge, behavioral change, promote walking, blurring the boundaries of teaching inside and outside. Equally, at the moment, is also the subject of energy. Passive design, fundamental, integrating vegetation in the projects and uh, minimizing use of transport. Where transport is, it's electric. All the renewable energy generated on site through solar technology, no wind that services the entire development. Water, we have multiple water reservoirs, some below ground, some above ground, captured like the stepping wells inspired, but in a contemporary fashion. And also in terms of waste modularization and prefabrication, but also using food waste for our urban agriculture. And in biodiversity, reintroducing indigenous flora and fauna, but something that was also interesting came from the client in that he said, every bedroom and every classroom must have a view towards greenery or park. So I will quickly skim through here. So we did analysis of the site. This is just irradiation, but interesting. You need to start understanding how the day changes. We started done a, a, an extensive five month period of an analytics in terms of placement of buildings, adjacencies to other buildings, how tall they are, whether we have detached cavity roofs or separate bigger roofs that overhang and provide shading in some area. The bars on the right show how energy is consumption is reduced or even interesting little features Instead of having a central corridor, let's have eccentric corridors. They become balconies, they become shading devices, and you can see the impact how solar radiation is reduced on the facades because none of these accommodations have cooling. That's what we set out, no cooling for the residential units. So we have to minimize overheating. And we've ended up, this is just a summary, a little matrix where we pass to the architect PLP, they could choose for depending on orientation, how to deal with the roof, the shading, the solid elements through a simplified menu. Behind here sits a whole raft of analysis. And examples of what these might look like are shown here. But we also looked at the academic buildings. But interestingly enough here, unifying multiple buildings under a larger canopy which not only brings people together, but starts shading majority of these buildings and minimizing the demand for energy. Some of these obviously do have cooling in certain areas, but again, the whole objective is to minimize demand for cooling through good natural ventilation, good daylight penetration. But we also studied external spaces because these are often forgotten, the spaces between buildings, because if you want to use them or offer these as potential spaces of teaching even, they have to be attractive to people to use, not too hot, not too windy. And studies were undertaken for those as well, some referential images. What is also important to understand 
is understanding the realities of life, how you roll these out. Master plans don't come in one go. They come in phases and steps. And that is challenging in the sense that you are not sure what happens next, but you set your objectives for the whole master plan. So what you see here, the, th the four colors give you an example of what was developed for first phase to be delivered and what is to come later. And as part of that phasing, one needs to understand how to invest your money. You could make one building, this little image on the bottom, right inside the green bars, that's the academic building in one piece of the master plan. You can make it super eco, but then not pay attention to the residential. But for the same money, if you look at the image above, you can go for a slightly lower performance environmental, but every building will achieve that for the exactly the same investment. So this is where we have been telling our client, do something everywhere. Don't go into symbolic statement. If I was to exaggerate, don't do a, a comments bank on NAW, but spread it everywhere. And it, when you look at time, we need to understand what changes. Things like facade structures and foundations will really not change. Certainly, facades may change in 50, 30, 40, 50 years, ideally not more or longer. But nothing else really changes so quick. So therefore, you, these elements should attract more money. So whereas the technical systems change much faster, and you need to consider that. And when you look at this little timeline, you start understanding how by the time we finish phase four, which is the green bar, we already have to undertake major retrofit for phase one. It's an ongoing life cycle. So the whole element of a circular economy comes to play here. How we are reusing elements of, let's say, the construction of phase two or phase three. Some of those elements start then to become reused for phase one. And this just summarizes briefly where we wanted to be. And what we found interesting is there is a massive amount of data processing and uh, learning and sharing. And students then move out once they've graduated and hopefully become messengers of what can be achieved. I'll quickly move on to Trenetia in Norway. This is in Bergen. This is a central lake in the city of Bergen. The old town of Bergen is dying because people with money are going on the outskirts and the older generation is left in the city. So this project, the client's name is Bob, B-O-B, -B, Norwegian client, and the architects were British architects, Ward Thistleton. What I wanted to show in Norway is interesting how much electricity is used in buildings, even though they have uh, this uh, district heating is used in certain elements of some of the bigger cities also here in Bergen. But a lot of it is power because it is hydropower. And the client agreed we would go for ZEB, zero emission buildings. And, um, but there are different levels of ZEB. So one needs to understand exactly where we're pitching. Are we just doing in use or are we going for end of life? So we, the client said no, he will not go for the most highest standard, which is called Z complete. But we are going for energy in use and for build to zero carbon. We compared the development with other benchmarks and other um, uh, urban developments in Norway. I should have said this development is about 1,500 homes. We developed a stakeholder scoring matrix whereby it's the people, meaning whether it's local citizens, tourists, future residents to come here, businesses around this development, the institutions, and the environment. They all have to work together. So we developed a scoring matrix for this. And uh, start understanding where the site sits. This is a lake. You may wonder how on earth and why should we develop in a lake? This is the antithesis of sustainability. But the subject really is this lake is contaminated over many years of heavy metals being washed down the rivers and deposited in the base of the lake. The lake has been sealed at the bottom and they're trying to bring new life back into it. So 
how do we institch a new development into an existing city? And the client spoke to the city and came up with a concept of developing something in this lake. Quickly explaining, we know about Norway cold climate this, but this particular site has a peculiarity. The peculiarity is very, very heavy rainfall, almost 270 days, because you have something called inversion, climatic inversion. And we all know very few days of sunshine and solar angles. So what we found was that we introduced a series of strategies. We call them solar corridors. How do we position understanding that in the mid season, you get a bit of sunshine to use, but they are Southwest to Southeast. So we angled that and we started looking at orienting, or orienting buildings to maximize solar gains in the South. So these little sketches show you a little bit what we mean by the floating village. We introduce canals. They are part of the solar axis, the diagonals. We started changing density going north so that any overshadowing goes to the water and not to each other. And then we introduced links and bridges. And um, what you see here is a mutation just the east, if you want to call it diagonally east-west, are so our, our pedestrianized solar corridors, and the northeast, northwest are uh, sorry, southwest to northeast are our canal corridors. We've then started cutting and carving. So this is like on a building, but now you're doing a master plan, you start manipulating geometry, opening up to the north, such that the squares that you see on the north get enough sunshine and daylight. And all that area that we cut away, we add it to the top. So the client gets the same area of development and flats this 1,500 homes, but redistributed in a way that is more environmentally conscious. And just some renderings, the image on the right is from the north looking down, and this is typical what we call the solar corridors and canals. So this summarizes the steps. There were many more steps in between from a more unified level to a more articulated and pixelated solution. But really, all of these being endorsed by environmental analytics. And also understanding acoustics. It has nothing to do with carbon, but it has to do with quality of life. There is a motorway whizzing to the south, noise. So studies were done about impact on the elevations of the development, which you see on the top three. But then what we also found is rather than investing more money onto the facades of the buildings, it was cheaper to do something, a barrier, acoustic barrier around the motorway, and therefore minimize the impact on the buildings. And elements in this climate is be careful with glazing ratios, minimize them to the north and maximize to the south, the opposite of what you might expect. Roofscapes are very popular because of the shortage of sunshine and are becoming very attractive places for uh, biodiversity in planting and use and social and amenity space. Passageways and canopies, why? Because of the heavy rains and snows and wind screening because of wind shear factors. So these are little elements that become unique to this particular climate with a rendered image of what Trenetia might look like. Quickly, lastly, because my time is running out, is in London. I've called this master plan X because I am not allowed to share with you the name of this master plan because it still has not got planning. It's about to get planning. Um, but as you can already see, it is a master plan with some existing high-rise developments, some new developments stitched into an urban tissue of London. The scheme itself is 230,000 meters squared, of which majority, over 70%, is residential. The challenge here is, obviously, you have an existing urban infrastructure, so it's easy just to connect to. But the reality is, we needed to do a lot more. Part of this is driven more by planning, to be fair, than the client wishes to do zero carbon, but the planners. To be part of the process of achieving 2050, 
what's been happening is that we unfortunately are dependent in part, as you can see from this development already, we can't going back, put a lot of PV on the roof and generate a lot of solar energy, certainly in this climate is insufficient. So what we've had to do here is to link in with buying power, green power through a decarbonized grid, but at the same token, also no longer using gas. We've moved away from gas, and we've been able to link up with the facility for waste energy generation, centralized offsite, managed by a company that is owned by the particular Borough of London. And coupled with that is targeting what we call the future home standard, which is a 75 to 80% reduction in performance, meaning the performance of the building envelope for the residential units compared to 2013. I won't go into this. There is a shift happening, but in London, it is being primarily driven through planning laws. And what you find here is for the first phase of this master plan, you see in pink is the uh, construction details that we're going for. No point in reading, just to let you know, the client did not want to go all the way to the maximum performance facade, like triple glazing and super U values. He was not prepared to invest that. He was prepared to leave that for future phases. So this is where the economic balances come into play. And what I mentioned earlier today about the paradox, if this was in another developing world, we would straight go to the green bar. And also understanding in planning laws, the terminologies, because zero carbon they talk is operational. And we all know that embodied carbon as operational carbon reduces, embodied carbon becomes a bigger and bigger parameter. So if we look at the total carbon life cycle, we need whole life cycle carbon, we need to go beyond embodied carbon. So we showed this little district network heating, it's waste energy that's producing hot water, which then is fed to the site coming from offsite. There used to be a coal-fired district heating station many, many years ago in this site, obviously that's gone. So now we're using a new district heating network system serviced by uh, burning waste. And that is a small segment of the master plan, the first phase buildings that's being fed to. But what is interesting in these graphs, you will find on the gray graph in particular, with, as we're talking about carbon, is that that is the lowest element out of all the comparators. My concluding remarks are the following, which I'd like to pass to you. We should embrace technology, but we should stay master and not slave of it. We have amazing tools at our disposal and the technology to analyze and assess, but we need to be honest and we need to base it on facts rather than what we would like it to perform in fictional terms. There is a wonderful reference by a professor, Sir Kenneth Robinson. Unfortunately, 10 days ago, he passed away. And he coined the word human ecology, the richness of human capacity. It is what he called the gift of human imagination. And he went in so far to say, by the way, I should have said he is a, or was a professor in arts and education, so an educationalist. And he said, what's wonderful about young kids is they're not afraid to do things that are wrong or explore. And he says, if you are not prepared to do something that might be wrong, you will never come up with something original. And that he even thinks that our education system needs to change because the way it's structured, it's actually taking people out of creativity. I thought those were very powerful statements made by him. And uh, I urge you all to have a look at some of the TED lectures of his, uh, incredibly moving and funny at the same time. But what you see in front of you here, this is what's going to make change, I believe, and less us. In the end, we must change the mindset 
in how we approach and tackle this problem. We cannot solve it by carrying on with the same mindset that we've created it. And I leave you with this image, which is our friend Greta, angry Greta, as Pippi Longstocking. She wants some action from all of us. I thank you all for your attention and I wish you much success at the conference. Thank you.